So now let's look at the shifts of the demand curve and the things that can cause shifts in the demand curve. Uh, we refer to these five factors as the determinants of demand. You can see them here in front of you. Uh, consumer income, price of related goods, consumer taste, the consumer's expectations, and the number of buyers. Starting with consumer income. A consumer's income has a major impact on the products we buy, on the economic goods we consume. And so a consumer's income will affect the things that we can or cannot attain at any given time in our lives. Now here's the deal. Um, for me, I would say that when my income increases or over the years as I have, have generated more income in my life, I have been able to attain things that were nicer. Uh, for instance, on the screen we're looking at two products. On the right, our right, the uh, shirt from the brand Express. This is something that I like to consume. Um, I mentioned this in class, so this is something I enjoy spending my money on. Over here on the left is a brand from Walmart, Walmart brand polo, which is called Faded Glory. So for me, as my income increases as a consumer, I will tend to buy more of the things that I consider to be name brand and less of the things that I consider to be generic brand. Now I've also had times in my life where my income decreased and so certainly during those times I would be able to buy less name brand stuff and then I'd have to buy more generic brand. So in economics we call the goods we'll buy when our income increases a normal good. For me Express for men clothing would certainly be a normal good. We call the things that we would not buy if our income goes up an inferior good. So inferior goods, in this case, for me, it's the Walmart brand. Now let's take a look at how this would look on a graph or demand curve. So we're going to look at the top item first. A normal good for me is the Express for Men Polo brand. For me, if my income increases, if my income goes up, well, I'm going to buy more of the Express for Men clothes. So what we would say is that when my income goes up, I will literally demand more at all price points for Express for Men clothes. At the same time, if my income goes up, I will actually buy less inferior goods like the Faded Glory brand from Walmart. Therefore, my demand for the Faded Glory brand goes down. Again, when we look at consumer income, this has a major impact on the things we can buy. As our income goes up, we will buy more normal goods and we will buy less inferior goods. Notice on the graph, the shift to the right is an indication of the increase in demand. A shift to the left is an indication of a decrease in demand. The second way we can look at this with respect to normal inferior goods and their correlation to income is that if our income goes down, we will buy less normal goods, we'll buy less name brands. While at the same time, if our income goes down, this is actually good for the generic brands because, or the generic brand companies because now we're going to buy more of those generic brands. Again, notice the shifts in the demand curve. To the left is a decrease, to the right an increase. And both of these have a corresponding reaction, a cause and effect, if you will, as a result of a change in our income. The second thing that can affect our ability to consume reflects the price of related goods. For instance, when we look at the products we buy, we see that those products either have products that go well or complement the product we're buying or sometimes that we would replace that product with what we would call a substitute. For example, let's take the iPhone. The iPhone has become an ever popular smartphone on the smartphone market since 2006. Well, when we have the iPhone, we know that there are several other things we can use to complement the iPhone. For instance, the case. On top of the case, there's a myriad of apps that we can buy or we can consume that go along with the iPhone. Again, the things that complement the iPhone are a reflection of accessories that may make the iPhone operate better. Also, the price of related goods can work sort of in opposing forces. For instance, Powerade and Gatorade are very similar products. They're in the sim same market, but they're owned by two different companies. 
So if let's say the price of one of these goods goes up or goes down, well, this can have an adverse or a, um, a, a positive effect for the opposing product. Again, we can substitute one product for the other. Okay, let's look at how this would look on a graph. So let's say that we have the Xbox, Xbox 360. The price of the Xbox goes down, causing a movement along the existing demand curve. What's going to happen to the complementary products as the Xbox, de Xbox decreases in price? I think we can draw a safe assumption and say that if the Xbox goes down in price, again, because of the law of demand, more people will buy the Xbox. And as a result of this, more people will buy the accessories that complement the Xbox. So what's going to happen is that as a result of this de decline or decrease in price for the Xbox, the demand for many of the accessory products will actually go up and increase. Let's look at it from the perspective of substitute products. Let's say that Powerade increases their price. We know that an increase in price will cause a movement from one point to another point along the existing demand curve. In this case, we see a decline in the amount someone is willing to buy. Well, if Powerade raises their prices and I can substitute Gatorade for Powerade, well, then I may buy more Gatorade. Gatorade did not have to drop their price in this case, but they have experienced an increase in demand. Notice here, again, we have a movement along the curve because of a price change. Down here, we have a shift to the right of, in demand because of, uh, in this case, the price of a related good. All right, the third thing that can affect the demand curve reflects the consumer's tastes. Now, you can think about many different things in your life that you have bought at one point or another that you may not buy today. When I was a young coach L back in the uh, 80s, there was a group called Poison. And Poison was a very popular band. Poison was a really popular group amongst the young people at the time. Well, today, I don't listen to Poison anymore. I don't like Poison anymore. My tastes have changed. And so for me, the popularity of this group band back in the day was something that no longer exists in my life today. I would not spend my money, I would not create a dollar vote for this product anymore. So what is popular today? Well, maybe something more contemporary. Again, popularity decreases, we'll see in a decrease in demand for things like the 80s band Poison, and today we'll see a little more popular, uh, and today we'll see a little more demand increase on, with respect to Drake. Again, let's look at how this would look on a graph. So here we have 1960s apparel, the bell-bottom jeans, the tie-dye shirt, and the whole attire. Today, this is not a very popular look. So for the, with respect to the demand curve, today we see a shift to the left for things like this because it's just not that popular anymore. So what's popular today? Well, maybe this whole, uh, I think the kids call it an emo look, right? And so this little emo look, if you will, is more popular. As a result, we see a shift to the right in the demand curve for this, for this look. Again, decrease in demand, increase in demand. The fourth thing that can affect the demand curve and shift it to the right or the left is the way we look at the future. Have you ever bought a product only to find out that a different model was coming out a few years later? This might have happened to you with the smartphone market or a computer or even a car. In 2011, they updated the current ver or the old version of the Mazda RX-8 to a newer version, a different bumper, different wheels, just a slightly different model. Well, if I know that there's going to be a different model of a car or a smartphone coming out in the future, I will most likely hold back my consumption today. My consumption might even fall to zero today for this product because I'm expecting, I'm anticipating a better product. So consumer expectations refers to the way that we look at the future. The way we look at the future, well, the way things can change in the future, and this can certainly deal with like things like technology, products, or the economy as a whole. So our examples here would be like going from the iPhone to 5 to the iPhone 6. If you find out there's going to be an iPhone 6, then you might hold off purchasing an iPhone 5. Uh, if you know that there's going to be a change in the body style of your car, you may hold off and purchase 
that car in, in the, subs, in the uh, following years. Graphically, how does this work? Again, if we think that there's a new iPhone coming out, then we might hold back our consumption or have a shift to the left in the demand curve for the old iPhone. So we'll see a shift to the left for the old iPhone, if you will, and a shift to the right of the new iPhone. The last thing that can shift the curve to the right or the left reflects the number of buyers. When I moved to Georgia, I understood there would be a lot of Georgia Bulldog fans. I guess I didn't anticipate the impact of the rivalry of the Georgia-Florida weekend. So every fall, for the last seven years that I've lived in this area, I've seen this rivalry proceed. And during this weekend, the Georgia-Florida weekend, the game is actually played in Jacksonville, which I suppose is a little bit more of a neutral site, if you will, although maybe it favors the Gators. But I did notice that a majority of the people in Georgia that come to watch this game make a stop in St. Simons Island. And so the population increases only for a short time, just for a weekend, but it increases nonetheless. So when we see an increase in the number of buyers, we see an increase in the number of consumers, an increase in the population, whether it is short-lasting or long-lasting. During Georgia-Florida weekend, because of the increase in population, we see an increase in a lot of different prices in a lot of different products. For instance, hotel rooms. Restaurants may maybe jump or increase their prices. And let's think about some other examples. Last year, the Olympics were held in London, or in 2012, and they anticipated a million plus people to watch these games, the summer games. Well, hotels and anyone in hospitality is going to understand that this is going to occur. And they're going to be able to increase their prices as a result of the demand for their product. Let's look at it in the opposite direction. Detroit, Michigan, uh, in the early part of the 1900s all the way up to the 1970s, saw an increase in their population. It maxed at about 1.8 million people. Today, Detroit has lost 1 million people in a, a relatively small area of just the city in the confines of the city. So it's not uncommon today to see that many people have abandoned their houses or left or gone to a different state. And as a result, the property values and many of the different uh, pricings in that area have gone down. All right, so let's just look at this again as an increase in population or a decrease in population. During the Georgia-Florida weekend, during the Super Bowl, during the Olympics, there's going to be an increase in population. So many of the other things that would be potentially sold at those time periods are going to see an increase in demand. Detroit has lost a lot of people. They're going to see a decrease in demand for many products. How would this look on the graph? Well, here we have Georgia, Florida. Here we have the Jacksonville Landing that many people go to after the game. The products that exist in this area are going to see an increase in demand. Here we have the Georgia, Florida. Uh, we, Georgia, Florida. Um, here we have the uh, football game after all these people have left and the area returns to normal. Well, they'll see a decrease in demand. So if you, so if you can master these five concepts and these five factors that go into the shifting of the right or the left of the demand curve, then you're well on your way to understanding demand and what can change demand. We'll talk more about this stuff in class. You can go ahead and proceed with the online quiz, video quiz for shifts of the demand curve.